welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoya Onya, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies prior to and following COVID-19 from the perspectives of founders, CEOs and other senior executives who are working on the development of transformative life-saving solutions for patients. My guest today is Ms. Stella Vanuk, CEO of Diverse Biotech, an innovative clinical stage biopharmaceutical research company that is committed to discovering and developing novel therapeutics from its proprietary and patented cost technology platform in cancer research. Excitingly, in addition to obtaining both a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biology, Anthropology, and Mathematics, as well as a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree from Temple University, Stella also holds an MBA from LaSalle University. Stella sits on two corporate boards and is passionate about the transformation of the pharmaceutical industry to an innovative, outcome-driven industry. Stella and I connected on LinkedIn based on the strength of our mutual connections and our shared passion for scientific innovation. I thought she would be a great guest for the podcast, given her unique background as a registered pharmacist, industry executive, and board member. Welcome to the show, Stella. Thank you so much. I am grateful and humbled by your introduction. <laughs> oh, well, it's all what you've done. And I think it's so amazing when you hear that from somebody else's ear mouth. You're like, wait, I did all of that. And I love to showcase women like you because it's not easy. And to add the immigrant story, which we both share, that takes it to yet another level. So we're going to go ahead and get started with what I believe is the most important question. So what is your definition of scientific innovation? Well, as a scientist, as you mentioned, um, first and foremost, um, I believe that innovative therapeutics that will leave patients feeling better or lead to improved patient outcomes is what I define as a scientific innovation. Yeah. It could be a new drug for mm -hmm. treatment that isn't available or mm -hmm. a new test, device, or a vaccine. But mm -hmm. anything that improves outcomes, um, I think to me, is an innovation. I love that you say that because I, I share the same definition as you, so brava. Um, what is your most notable accomplishment before becoming a CEO? I think that it's, it's a journey that's difficult to pierce out because as a scientist, I, I think that I'm proud of accomplishments that I've had in the laboratory with my, yeah. my colleagues. Yeah. But I think from a business perspective, I, I think the two most things that I'm proud of is my uh, learning to transform uh, organizations. So I call it a transformational leadership. Wow. And that's really all about transforming organizations in the right way, building teams, mm -hmm. building strong cultures, mm -hmm. and actually inspiring new leaders uh, to rise from your leadership. And I guess the second part would be driving business because mm -hmm. that has to be a priority in terms of how do you launch product, how do you generate revenue so the organization is sustainable. Right, right. Very well said. Now, can you provide us with a top line overview of potential or ongoing work that might be related to immunotherapy on and or anti-infectives? Well, I'll stay um, with, for example, glioblastoma. Right. Because that's one of the areas that we focus on. Glioblastoma is a very challenging disease. And I, mm -hmm. many have said that um, many have tried and none have succeeded. And that's devastating because there are so many patients, adult patients and pediatric patients mm -hmm. that really have very poor survival. So I think right. our cusp technology offers that innovation because mm -hmm. we're conjugating two molecules together. Mm -hmm. One crosses the blood being barrier and takes the other one across and the other one, and both of them together works in the brain. But there are other technologies that are available. And actually as a scientist, I will implode everyone to go after until we're able to find treatment yes. and ultimately cure for yes. this devastating disease. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that it ties back to what your definition of innovation was. 
It's about finding that sort of uh, white lining, white space, whether it's a repurposing an old drug, which gives it a new utility or thinking from scratch about how can we improve? And those improvements can be in increments. It doesn't have to be sort of black and white before you say this is uh, scientific innovation. That's right. Because a lot of the things when we talk about innovation also has to be meaningful from a pricing yeah. perspective, right? Yeah. So you yeah. have to create drugs in a way that they're affordable to the healthcare system and there is a health economics story as well. Yeah. So I'm actually a big supporter for in a, in a meaningful innovation that we can uh, employ right away to improve patients' outcomes mm -hmm. and allow for the system to sustain the cost of that new drug. Right. I, again, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but now let's see if we have a different take, uh, because this is going to be quite personal. So thinking about diverse biotech, how has COVID-19 um, affected the way you approach work internally? Well, Diverse Biotech is a small company, so we already work virtually quite a bit. But yeah. because we're early stage, we go through a lot of meetings. So the first thing is now all the yeah. meetings are virtual. Yeah. So we have to, of course, adopt to virtual communications, which is with investors as well yeah. as, you know, with our partners. Yeah. Again, for us, the impact has been also in how our partners yeah. uh, impacted by COVID-19. We have worked with universities. Mm -hmm. that have either closed or slowed down their operations. Mm -hmm. And when they had departments working on our research, they had to deprioritize our research in mm -hmm. order to focus on COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Some of the smaller CROs, because we want to support our local business and our local CROs, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, because they couldn't have that many people working in a small laboratory together, they have to shift to one or two people per um, their eight hour work shifts wow. and then have people working at night on your yeah. research. But of course, I'm not the only project that they have. Mm -hmm. so that really slowed down our R&D platform and deliverables. And so I guess the third one, because we're depending on reaching our milestones yeah. in order for investors to continue to invest in us, yeah. that also had a trickle effect on, well, the university's closed, the CROs have slowed down. Now I'm six months behind. Wow. <laughs> showing the data that I'm supposed to get me the next investment. Wow. But, um, so it, it really had, and nobody could have accounted for this. So we're trying yeah. to figure out how, how do you manage in this new world? I mean, right. we're blessed with contracts like with Duke University mm -hmm. that are going to do our studies in glioblastoma and in vivo, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but also we had to delay because mm -hmm. of COVID-19 implications by months, the initiation yeah. of that study. Wow, wow. I mean, I love your honesty because I think it's very important for our audience to hear the sort of the stories of real American leaders that are out there struggling to bring in money, but at the same time, the data that you need for fundraising are being delayed because who is going to do the work? So that is really frustrating. And it just makes me wonder, you know, if, is there even an end game? Like, what does the end even look like? But that's a story for another day. And I would love to bring you back at some point in the future just to see how your, um, your viewpoint has evolved between now where we're sort of still in, in the middle of this pandemic versus a year or two from now how has that changed but well i'll actually give you one more thought if yeah you will. so when we're dealing with all of these delays and investors i actually personally know a girl who's a young girl she's 16 and she has glioblastoma wow. and her tumor is growing unfortunately and her condition is deteriorating and it's heartbreaking because this type of cancer doesn't care about uh, mm -hmm. my delays in my CRO network or university or my funding. Yeah. Right? So when we all hope to achieve that phase one trial where potentially we can enroll patients, that looks like it's a moving target yeah. into much further months while we have patients that we cannot help. So that actually is what's keeping me up at night. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that there are patients we could be helping and being in a situation where you know exactly what to do. Yeah. You're just not moving fast enough. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and that ties in very nicely with my second question because uh, it seems to me, my follow-up question, it seems to me that now you're dealing with a young woman that has, you know, a, a very aggressive form of brain, brain cancer, brain, a brain tumor, essentially. And as you think about corporate social responsibility, talk to me a little bit more about how that has been affected as well as a result of the pandemic. Well, I think there's two ways that one can answer. I can take a business approach and say there's a social responsibility to continue to have the organization moving forward. Yeah. Offer flexible working arrangements and be um, compassionate and understanding for people mm -hmm. not working from home, but trying to manage their workflow yeah. as they're trying to manage their families and kids are at home and staying with priorities and everybody I talk to work longer hours. Yeah. But trying to be as a leader, understanding of that challenging dynamic yeah. and people frankly are isolated. And I think yeah. we are much most of us are social creatures right so i think that there's also emotional aspect of that but also my social responsibility is to all those patients this is why i i'm in this business i want to be able at the end of my lifetime to say because of what we have launched or the drugs we develop yeah these many patients mm -hmm. can live. it's really a simple reward and that has the social responsibility aspect that is more grandiose than than any of of this yeah so i wish that my social responsibility answer could give me all the investment and all the uh, open road to all of my cro network because i could save that girl yeah yeah i, I think that is very well said and thank you for sharing those insights so now let's talk philosophy for a little bit um <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think would are some key consideration factors that will be important for, in order for us to sustain innovation in the life science industry? I think we have to do two things. I have to, we have to be open to um, invest in, investment in innovation. One of the things as a CEO of an early startup company I hear all the time is there's not enough data. There's, you know, come back to me later, come back to me when you're in phase three, but it's very difficult to raise money for innovation. So unless you're part of a university or part of a large company, it's, it's challenging to um, rise above and shine and get the, the, attract those investors early. So if we want to foster innovation from young scientists, from other individuals who are not part of university or large companies, we have to create means. So there has to be some more programs available to support preclinical uh, innovation. I think that would be um, the first step. And I think it will be very important post COVID because look at everybody else looking at the vaccine. Right now, now that it's a mission, everybody's on board and then there's funding. But the same thing, glioblastoma has been around for a very long time and it's uncurable and it's the deadliest cancer out there, but there isn't a mission. And actually it's very challenging to raise money for something like this because is it a graveyard for investment or is it an opportunity to save many lives? Yeah, that is extremely uh, well said. I think again, maybe because people don't know that glioblastoma is a, a brain tumor. And that's part of the reason why I'm grateful for a podcast like this because we have to educate the public and to tell them these are the concepts that are important these are and, and give them epidemiological data so they know about it and then we can leverage that support and and also educate investors because we can all keep giving to the same type of disease as you said look how much investment is now going into covid 19 vaccines but were we thinking about that even a year or two ago you know but exactly <laughs> I mean, but I mean, this is sort of um, goes hand in hand. Uh, is there any technology or company that you're currently excited about? And, and that could also include your own company. I just want to know. <laughs> I'm completely biased. <laughs> so I'm going to say that I'm very excited about our cusp platform. Yeah. yeah. And I think because, not just because of glioblastoma, but because our cusp platform actually has over 300 molecules that we can conjugate. 
So we can offer solutions in dermatology. We can offer solutions, believe it or not, in pain management. Mm -hmm. We can create new class of drugs mm -hmm. that could treat pain, address pain without opioids. Mm -hmm. so we have limitless opportunities to create new class of drugs that are more efficacious and less toxic. So I think that's exciting. And for that, we would need partners. So if there are people that are looking for new treatments in pain or addiction, I want to talk to them. If there are new mm. drugs that need to be solving um, anti-infectives, antivirals, mm -hmm. I want to be talking to those people. I want to be able to have this platform serve above and beyond diverse biotech and create this partnership network where we can have this technology available to them. So that is wonderful, and thank you for showcasing that. I've always believed, like, if you don't believe in your own technology, then who can and who should? So then why are you doing it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so now, um, how would your advice for a new biotech CEO be different today versus prior to COVID-19? I think uh, the one word that comes, comes to mind right now is resilience. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> right. I think that I think that resilience is very important. And honestly, my team and I share a quote because we're all we're all fans of uh, Sun Tzu, the the principles. Yeah. Yeah. So in the midst of crisis, there is opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that one should write this down and really think about it, because we, those of us that will rise above the challenge. Mm -hmm. We'll be resilient and persistent because of our core belief in what we're doing and why mm -hmm. we're doing this. We will be successful. Mm -hmm. I feel like saying amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the beauty of our conversation. And that's why I wanted to launch this podcast because we are all humans at our basic fundamental. We can have multiple degrees and accomplishments, but it doesn't change the fact that you are a human being. So what I've heard from you is to be successful, you have to be relentless. You have to be resilient. And uh, you have to be flexible because these things are going to happen in waves. And you still have to remember the why. Why are you doing this? So, and that's why I like that you highlighted your technology as something that you're truly excited about. And I can't wait for people to start asking you questions about what can we do to support your, your work in brain tumor research and other cancers. You also mentioned dermatology as an area, pain management with the opioid crisis and alternative to that. So the cost of technology is definitely something that I want as many people to, to hear about. Um, but I'm going to give the floor back to you and whatever you want to say, any thoughts, commentary, anything you want to share for the, the last section of a, a podcast, the floor is yours. Honestly, what I want to say is uh, an appreciation and a gratitude to you. Because of what you do, uh, we're able to spread the word about uh, smaller companies like ours, about our mission, and, and ultimately uh, bringing patients with high and med needs solutions that they need. So I, I'm so thankful for this opportunity and uh, I look forward to connecting with you whenever you want to come back and chat with me. Oh, that's wonderful. The pleasure is mine. I've always believed that small companies are the forefront of innovation and it's important to amplify that innovation. So it's been a pleasure speaking with you today and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.